welcome to this week's episode of To Be Continued. Today, um, we're going to be reading The Wanderer by Sharon Creech. And this book has won a Newbery Award. So, we're going to start and read the first few pages of this book. The Sea. The Sea, the Sea, the Sea. It rolled and rolled and called to me. Come in, it said, come in. And in I went, floating, rolling, splashing, swimming. The sea called, come out, come out. And the further I went, but always it swept me back to shore. And still the sea called, come out, come out. And in boats I went, in rowboats and dinghies and motorboats. And after I learned to sail, I flew over the water with only the sounds of the wind and the water and the birds, all of them calling, sail on, sail on. And what I wanted to do was go on and on across the sea alone with the water and the wind and the birds. But some said I was too young and the sea was a dangerous temptress. And at night I dreamed a terrible dream. A wall of water, towering, black, crept up behind me and hovered over me and then down. Down it came, but always I woke before the water covered me. And always I felt as if I were floating when I woke up. Chapter two, three sides. I am not always such a dreamy girl listening to the sea calling me. My father, my father calls me three-sided Sophie. One side is dreamy and romantic, one side is logical and down to earth, and the third side is hard-headed and impulsive. He says I am either in dreamland or earthland or mule land, and if I ever get the three together, I'll be all set, though I wonder where I will be then. If I'm not in dreamland or earthland or mule land, where will I be? My father says my logical side is most like him and the dreamy side most like my mother, which isn't entirely fair, I don't think. My father likes to think of himself as a logical man, but he is the one who pours over pictures of exotic lands and says things like, we should go on a safari, and we should zip through the air in a hot air balloon. And although my mother is a weaver and spins silky cloths and wears flowing dresses, she is the one who gives me sailing textbooks and makes me study water safety and weather prediction and says things like, yes, Sophie, I taught you to sail, but that doesn't mean I like the idea of you being out there alone on the water. I want you to stay home, here, with me, safe. My father says he doesn't know who my hard-headed mule side resembles. He says mules don't run in the family. I am 13 and I am going to sail across the ocean. Although I would like to go alone, 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 flying over the water, I'm not. My mule self begged a place of order, 45 foot sailboat with a motley crew, three uncles and two cousins. The uncles, Stu, Mo, and Doc are my mother's brothers and she told them, if the slightest harm comes to my Sophie, I'll string you all up by your toes. She isn't worried, although maybe she should be, about the influence of my cousin Brian. Quiet, studious, serious Brian, but he, but she frets over the bad habits I might learn from my other cousin, Cody. Cody is loud, impulsive, and charming in a way my mother does not trust. He's too charming, she says, in a dangerous sort of way. My mother isn't the only person who is not thrilled for me to take this trip. My uncle Stu and Mo tried their best to talk me out of it. It's going to be a bunch of us guys doing guy things, and it wouldn't be a very pleasant place for a girl. And wouldn't you rather stay home, Sophie, where you could have a shower every day? And it's a lot of hard work, and yakety yak they went. But I was determined to go, and my new self kicked in, sprouting a slew of sailing and weather terms, battering them over the head with all the things I'd learned in my sailing books, and with some things I'd made up, for good measure. Uncle Doc, the good uncle I call him because he's the only one who doesn't see any harm in my coming, said, heck, she knows more about boats than Brian and Cody put together. And so they caved in. There are two other reasons my mother has not tied me to my bed and refused to let me go. The first is that Uncle Doc gave her an extensive list of the safety provisions aboard the boat, which include a satellite navigator, the global positioning system. The second reason, not a very logical one, but one that somehow comforts my mother, is that Bumpy is on the other side of the ocean. We will end up in Bumpy's arms, and she wishes she could join us for just that moment. Bumpy is my grandfather, my mother's father, and also Uncle Doc, Stu, and Moe's father, and he lived with my parents for many years. He is like a third parent, and I love him because he is so like me. He is a man of three sides, like me, and he knows what I am thinking without me, without my having to say it. He is a sweet man with a honey tongue, and he is a teller of tales. At the age of 72, Bumpy decided to go home. I thought he was already in his home, but what he meant by home was the place where he was born, and that place was the rolling green hills of England. My father was wrong about wheels not running in the family. When Bumpy decided to return to England, nothing was going to stop him. He made up his mind, and that was that, and off he went. Bye bye, Bumpy. Chapter three, slow time. We're hoping to set sail the first week of June, right after school ends. The final weeks are limping by, plodding hour after plodding hour. In my head, though, I am hurling myself toward that final day, picturing every little detail of it. I told my parents that I would zip home on the last day of school 
drive a backpack, snare a ride to the bus station, and meet my uncles and cousins in Connecticut, and off we would all go, sailing out into the sea. Not so fast, Sophie, my father said. When the time comes, your mother and I will drive you there. We're not dumping on a bus by yourself. Alas. In the wee little town where we live, everyone is having adventures except me. We used to live on the coast of Virginia, curling against the ocean, but last year my parents came up with their great plan to move us to the countryside because my mother was missing the Kentucky mountains in which she'd grown up. So we moved to the sleepy town, where the only water is the Ohio River, which is as sleepy as the town. People here sure love that river, but I don't know why. It doesn't have waves or tides. There are no crabs or jellyfish living in it. <coughs> You can't even see very much of it at a time, only at the little stretch up to the next bend. But for the kids in my class, that river is like paradise, and they have adventures on it and off of it. They have fished in that river, swum in it, rafted down it. I want to do things like that, but I want to do them on the sea, out on the wide, wide ocean. When I told some of my friends that I was going to sail across the ocean, one said, But it's nice here, with the river rolling along every single day. Another said, But you just got here. We don't know anything about you, like where you lived before and... I didn't want to get into all of that. I wanted to start from zero. There had been one good thing about moving here. It had been like starting over. Another said, why would you want to be a prisoner on a boat anyway? Prisoner, I said, prisoner. I'll be as free as the little jaybird up there floating in the sky. And so I told them about the waves calling me and the rolling sea and the open sky. And when I finished, they pretty much yawned and said, whatever. And you could die out there. And if you don't come back, can I have that red jacket of yours? I figured they were probably never going to accept my adventure and I was just going to have to go without their understanding why I wanted to go. My mother gave me this journal I'm writing in. She said, start now, write it down, all of it. And when you come back, we can read it and it'll be as if we were there too. My teachers don't want to hear about it though. Sophie, put away that sailing book and get out your math book. Sophie, school isn't over yet. Knuckle down to business. Get out that grammar homework. Yesterday, Uncle Doc phoned and said that we won't be sitting out across the ocean as soon as I get there. There is work to be done first. A lot, a lot of work. I didn't mind the thought of work because I like to mess around with boats, but I wanted to get out on the ocean so bad I can feel it and taste it and smell it. Chapter 4. The Big Baby In the end, it was only my father who drove me to Connecticut. My mother said she could not guarantee that she'd behave like an adult. She was afraid she would dissolve into a blob of jelly and cling to me and not let me go. I kept telling her that this was just a little trip across the ocean. No big deal. We're not even sailing the boat back because Uncle Doc is leaving it with a friend in England. I think my mother imagines horrible things happening out on the ocean, but she will not say so aloud. My own mind does not want to imagine horrible things. Sometimes, my father said, there are things you just have to do. I think this might be one of those things for Sophie. That surprised me. It did feel as if it was something I had to do, but I couldn't have said why, and I was surprised and grateful that my father understood this without my having to explain it. Okay, 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 my mother said, go, and you'd better come back home in one piece. For two long weeks, my uncles and cousins and I have been holed up together in Uncle Doc's small cottage. I am beginning to think we'll never live through this time on land, let alone the sea journey. We'll probably kill each other first. The boat is propped up on dry land and was a sorry sight that first day, I have to admit. It didn't look anywhere near ready to head out to sea, but it had a terrific name, The Wanderer. I can picture myself on this sailboat, wandering out across the, across the sea, wandering, wandering. The boat belongs to Uncle Doc, and he calls it his baby. It seems huge to me, enormous, far, far bigger than any boat I've ever been on. It's 45 feet long. That's a pretty big baby. Navy and white with two masts of equal size and nifty booms that wrap around the sails. Below decks, there's a sleeping for six, four in the forward section, two in the back, a galley with icebox, sink, and stove, a table, two of the beds double as bench seats for the table, a bathroom, a chart table and navigation equipment, and cubby holes and closets. Uncle Doc, who is a carpenter in his real life, walked us around the wanderer of the first day pointing out things that needed fixing. This baby needs a little attention, he said. Rudder needs work, yep. And the keel, too, yep. And the whole village needs redoing, yep. And those electrics, gotta rewire, yep. And whole things needs sprucing up, yep. Yep, yep, yep. My cousin Brian was busy making a list of all these things on his clipboard. Right then, Brian said after we'd walked around and around the boat, here's the list. I figure we should also make a list of the equipment we'll need. His father, Uncle Stu, interrupted. That's my boy, a real organizer. Uncle Stu's real name is Stuart, but everyone calls him Stu because he worries and stews about every tiny little thing. He is tall and thin, with a scrub of black hair on his head. Uncle Stu's son, Brian, looks like a younger photocopy of him. They both walk in a clumsy, jerky sort of way, as if they are string puppets, and they both place a high value on being organized. While Brian was still making up his list, my other cousin, Cody, started fiddling with the rudder. Not yet, Uncle Stu said. We're not organized yet. Brian said, we'll get our lists together and then divide up the jobs. That's my boy, Uncle Stu said. 
a real take charge sort of guy. Yep. It's hot, 95 degrees most days, and everyone has his own idea about how things should be fixed. Uncle Mo spends a lot of time leaning back in a deck chair, watching the rest of us in barking orders. Not that way, start on the other side. And, you knuckle-headed doofus, is there any way, is that any way to use a brush? Mostly this is aimed at his son, Cody, who has selective deafness. Cody can hear the rest of us just fine, but he can't ever seem to hear his father. Uncle Mo is a bit on the chubby side, and he likes lounging around with his shirt off, getting a tan. His son, Cody, the one that my mother thinks is charming in a dangerous sort of way, however, is fit and muscular, always humming or singing, and smiling that wide white smile of his. Girls who stroll through the boatyard on their way to the public beach stop and watch him, hoping to catch his attention. And Uncle Doc is easygoing and calm. Nothing seems to face him. Not all the work that needs doing, or the mishaps that occur, like when Brian knocked over a can of varnish, or when Cody gouged the deck, or when Uncle Stu tangled the lines. Uncle Doc just shrugs and says, we'll just fix it. Yep. On the second day, after Uncle Stu and Brian had doled out most of the assignments to everyone else, I said, what about me? What do you want me to do? You? Uncle Stu said. Oh, yeah. I guess you could clean up. You know, scrub things out. I want to fix something. Uncle Stu laughed a fake laugh. <laughs> and what do you think you could fix, Sophie? <laughs> I'd like to do that bilge. Oh, he said, smiling all around at everyone else as if they were sharing a private joke. Now, how exactly might you do that? And so I told him how it could be redesigned and what sort of equipment I might need. And the more I talked, the more Uncle Stu's smile faded, and the whiter the grin grew on Uncle Doc's face. See, says Uncle Doc, she knows something about boats. Let her tackle the bilge. Brian, with his clipboard in hand, jerked his puppet arm and said, Who's going to do the cleaning then? I don't have anyone down for cleaning. We'll all clean, Uncle Doc said. Not me, Uncle Mo said. I'm a lousy cleaner. Ask anybody. And so we, all of us, except for Uncle Mo, who was lying in his chair, getting a tan, have spent those hot, sweaty days working on the wanderer at the marina. We've repaired the rudder and keel, redesigned the village, rewired the electrics, and organized and cleaned. This morning, the wanderer came off her cradle. Doc and Brian and I were on board as the crane lifted the wanderer up in a sling and lowered her into the water. It was such an eerie feeling. Down, down, down she went. I didn't think it was going to stop going down, but then there was a floop and a wobble, and there she was, bobbing like a cork, afloat. You okay, Brian? Doc asked. You look a little wobbly. Sort of what to throw up, Brian said. This boat looks awful small now in the water. This is all that will keep us alive? Small, Uncle Doc said. This here wanderer is a pretty big baby. Our little island home, I said. I sent a postcard to my parents. I told them that soon I was going wandering on the wanderer. Okay, and that's where we're going to stop. If you'd like to check out this book, it's available at any of our library locations. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.